Endless Hustle presented by the Movie Trivia Schmodown. The Movie Trivia Schmodown is the ultimate mental sport for the movie fanatic. Intense movie trivia with the flair of pro wrestling. Championship matches, competing factions, MTS has the best competitors in the world. This isn't your parents' game show. The end of the season finale is a Schmodown Spectacular 6. All of the championships on the line and all the greats play here. This isn't bar trivia. This is the movie trivia showdown. We've got a great day on the Endless Hustle as I'm joined by a New York legend and now a TV legend, the one and only Barbara Corcoran, the queen of Shark Tank. Barbara, can you believe it? Another season of Shark Tank. This, this is a never ending show. It's going to go on forever. I think we're all going to die in our seats and they're going to replace us with young people for sure. <laughs> I had Damon on the show and Kevin over the last four to eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks, who knows? But those guys were a blast. And to see the chemistry that you guys have, the camaraderie, was that instantaneous? I mean, did this thing happen right away? Uh, not at all, because for the first year, Arthur, we were all scared. I, I, the only guy who wasn't scared the day he sat on the set, honestly, was Mark Cuban. He came in like a cocky son of a gun, and I don't think he's had a scary thought in his whole life. But for the rest of us, we were constantly called, tell, telling us that the, sh the show wouldn't be continued. Uh, we wouldn't get enough episodes. You better plan on something else. So for the first couple of years, it was pretty damn choppy. Of course, Cuban didn't care. He kept looking at his bank account every morning and he <laughs> thought, what would I have to worry about? Life is good, right? Yeah, even on the show, I tell you the truth, I'm still astounded. Like somebody will come in and ask for like uh, 800,000. We'll say, I'll take double the double the stock and I'll give you triple the price. And we're like, what? Did he do the math? I mean, the money almost at times feels meaningless. And I realized there's a real, really big difference between a billionaire and a millionaire, like night and day. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about your story because you have such an incredible and inspirational story for those. I know you've spouted it many times, but for those oh, who haven't times. heard it, your journey from essentially secretary and kind of down and out to becoming Barbara Corcoran is incredible. Do you kind of ever look back and think, how did I get here? This is all so surreal. You know, it's not, uh, it's very easy for me to remember. I was at diner waitress the night, the, the very lucky night, my first boyfriend walked in and became my business partner and gave me the thousand dollar loan to start the business. So I can look back at those days of all those menial jobs and hustling. But it's kind of weird. I look back at them, realizing I was very happy. If somebody hadn't walked in, I don't think I would have had the gumption to get out and start something on my own. It just happened to be a lucky break. And I thought even my attitude at that time was, hey, what the heck? I'll give it a whirl. I gave everything else a whirl. It was my 23rd job by that point. And so there's no big deal. It was kind of, hey, give it a whack and see what happens. I was uh, surprised and I'm still surprised. And I think back sometimes to those early days and thinking, wait, how did I get to be one person to a thousand people? How did that happen over those 20 some odd years? Like what were the key moves? And I could distinctly know in hindsight that the key moves was I had a good marketing head. I could grandstand anything, make something small look big. But I, I am almost having a hard time remembering what those steps were at that point that somehow got you from A to Z because they were so steady and you were never in the moment when you were taking a step or making a decision, you were already in the next step, worried about the next step, worried about the next step. And before you knew it, 25 years had flown by and you had a big business. I don't when know if I answered your question. Did I, Arthur? I'm not you sure. You did. And it's funny because I think about this all the time as a 43-year-old, now middle-aged man, which is bonkers to me because it feels like I was 21 yesterday. But yeah. you look back at the steps of your life and you realize how they all essentially accumulated to get you to where you were, even if you didn't realize at that moment that they were accumulating towards a common purpose. It's incredible. Yeah. You know what it's similar to? It's almost like when you have kids and they grow up, you look back and you, you remember them as little, but you don't know what happened to that middle section that flew by and now they're all grown up and out of the house. You know, it, it goes by so fast and, and you lose that middle ground a bit, I think. You are such an iconic New Yorker. And for those who either are transplants or New York natives, there is no city on the planet like New York. It's energy, it's electricity, it's innovation. It inspires all of us to be better. For you, what was your New York moment? What was the moment in your life where New York had this significant impact on you and helped change the direction of your life? 
Uh, truly, it was the first day I stepped foot in New York because I was walking on 86th Street. I distinctly remember it. I had gotten my first apartment with two roommates in the Village Voice. We we're all sharing a one bedroom. And the first day I went, my first job wasn't real estate. It was a receptionist uh, job at a small building company. Uh, but when I walked out the door, um, I passed the newsstand and I was friendly. I was from New Jersey. Hello. Good morning, sir. You don't do that. You learn to stop that in New York right away if you're a young girl. But the very next day, I walked past the same newsstand to say hello. It was a different newsstand, different product, and a different guy. And I was like, wait, did I imagine this? And I realized so clearly, just on that one first impression, whoa, this city thrives on change. And I felt right away in my soul that there'd probably be room for me because I was a newcomer. It was, it was a city where change can happen. And you know what I found in short order, the city wasn't the kind of place that wanted to know who you were, where you're from. It was just, it didn't really give a damn about that. It just wanted to know what you could do. And not only what you could do, but what could you do for me now? You know, it was such a now city. And so I was caught up in the fever of New York. And in hindsight, I don't think I could have ever built my business in any city but New York. Not that I know all the cities, but when I visit cities around the States, at least, I can't imagine uh, having found a city that was more suitable uh, for me, uh, that welcomes everybody into a situation where uh, where the newcomer is welcomed, actually. And the other great impression I had, which gave me uh, almost like a self-power or like a, a, a tease or an excitement that, oh, I might be able to do this. I might be able to accomplish this dream I have for myself. It was a year into the business when I walked into the Real Estate Board of New York to meet my peers. And I walked into 60 guys in expensive suits and shoes, all looking alike, all the sons or grandsons of the wealthy guys in New York who own the real estate club. And when I looked and how they dismissed me and how they didn't even notice me, I realized they're not gonna take me seriously wait till I show them. And it beefed me up versus put me down because I realized they were ripe for picking because, you know, the big guys go to sleep on the wheel and they're not watching behind their back. A little guy's a scrapper, you know, like, who's going to get me? Who's going to get me? And I realized I had the advantage of coming from a poor background and they had the disadvantage of having assumed a lot that was supporting them and thinking uh, that it would be there forever but it's so easy to knock out a big guy if you're scrappy. You know, you just got to bite at his heels again and again and again every day of your life. And they're not watching you. They started watching when I was their rival, but it was too late, you know? It's funny you mentioned the scrappiness because I think that's the, what is so special about New York. Obviously, when you watch television, you see the glamour and the almost dynasty-like culture that we can see on the Upper East Side or in the West Village. So but true. at the end of the day... Transplants like you and I, what unites us is the scrappiness mm -hmm. of the city. Mm -hmm. It's also, uh, by the way, what annoys people about New Yorkers. God, they're so rude. They're so pushy. They're so fast. They walk too fast. I hear that all the time from visitors that come to the city and stay with me. So it's the good and the bad. You know, it doesn't, it isn't always the friendliest, warmest place in the world, but it sure lets you know what you're made of. No doubt about it. You have no choice. You've got to compete. If you're not a competitor, you kind of step to the side, sadly, in the city. Was there ever a moment, Barbara, that you walked by that newsstand after you had quote unquote made it and thought transplant Barbara to I made it Barbara and the mm -hmm. world in between? Honestly, I wasn't that romantic. Uh, no, I walked by a million newsstands. I'd never even crossed my mind. I'll try to think of it today, actually, I, uh, down, the, down the corner. Uh, no, because I was so busy living in the future, what the next step, the next battle, the next obstacle, the next issue, the next personnel problem, the next recruiting problem, the next foreign language somebody had to teach or learn or whatever, to keep up with the ever-changing New York City landscape. I was I was too self-focused on what the business needed, you know, who that business had to be, what complexity did it have, uh, how it was going to answer the needs of things that changed on a dime, you know, prices dropping, shooting up, uh, people leaving, swearing they'd never be back again, you know, all that crap that goes on and on in this changing city. So that kept me so busy with my mind and body on tomorrow uh, that I, I think it's a lacking in me to size something up and look back at something, you know, it's just like, uh, What's new? Not not what was, but well, hey, hey, what's new? What's coming at us? <laughs> where did the switch change? Where did it go from on to off where you realized 
okay, I'm not just an average person. I really am an entrepreneur. I'm driven and I can build an, what ended up becoming a multi-million dollar business. When was that moment that the, the switch just changed for you? Um, I'd like to say it was a switch, Arthur, and I could tell you the day and the moment and the hour. It really wasn't. It was uh, being aware in hiring salespeople, especially superstar salespeople, um, who had traits that made them phenomenally successful that I then afterwards recognized in myself. You know, for the first two years, I was a rental agent renting apartments, opening doors, running around. I thought my success, honestly, was based on my nice personality. People liked me. They trusted me, uh, maybe because I looked a little wet behind the ears from New Jersey and I didn't look like a hard New Yorker. And so people trusted me and I did well renting apartments. But it wasn't until I had to groom and then later recruit the key salespeople out of the competitive firms that I started to recognize uh, what they all had in common, which were they were all ambitious. You can't teach someone ambition. I don't even think you could teach a kid, maybe help them along. But, you know, some kids in a family are aggressive and some kids aren't. You know, some kids are soft and more loving and some kids aren't. And so I noticed that each of them that had that trait of ambition, uh, they were each, uh, whether they were born that way or groomed themselves that way, but they were competitive, sickly competitive. And what they also had, I noticed, is when they lost a deal, uh, a bigger deal than anybody else in the office, something they put more time in and more effort in than anybody else in the office. They took it hard, just like everybody in the office did, but their ability to feel sorry for themselves for just a minute or two and brush themselves off and get back out there was remarkable. They had that, they had that uh, bounce back ability. It was a faster speed, a, a jollier ball, you know, that kept bouncing. And so in hiring these people and nurturing them and supporting them and trying to get more and more of them in a sales organization, which is the bloodline of the organization, um, I started realizing they're all like me. And I'm like, I'm ambitious, I'm competitive, I'm good at bouncing back. And then I started seeing that those were my great traits just as they were in them. And so um, I think it wasn't a moment, but a gradual learning of, of kind of like how I was wired. You know, I was too busy looking out, so I couldn't uh, reflect in so much. Yeah. How important did failure play a role in your life? The, the, the constant failure, the constant no's, the constant rejection. How important is that in terms of success? Well, the important failure happens uh, when you're a kid, uh, not as an adult. By the time I was an adult, I was getting pretty good at that. I expected it. There's something about expecting failure that takes a lot of the bite out of it, right? But as a kid, uh, you're a, a clean slate. Uh, you're tender of heart. Uh, you're forming your impression of everything in life. And so uh, my great advantage at the time, it was terrible. Of course, I, I, I wouldn't wish it on any kid. But at the time, as a kid, being such a stupid student, just because I couldn't learn to read. I mean, if I had been able to unlock how to read, I mean, uh, reading is, uh, you know, the, the front door to all knowledge when it comes to school, not on the street, but when it comes to school. So if you can't read, uh, you can't uh you can't succeed at school in any, any subject. Reading is essential. So for me, I didn't learn to start to read till I was in seventh grade because I just had a brain wired that way. It wasn't through want of effort, but by third grade, I gave up. I hated the school. I hated the nuns. I hated the report card. I would change my marks, even though my father would sign them. He knew I changed them. He just let me off easy after a while, you know? But um, the school failure was so damaging to my psyche that I'll never get over it. I mean, I've gotten over 80% of it, but put me in a stress situation where I'm not confident, where I'm not overprepared, uh, where people are looking at me, where I'm supposed to be the expert. And I'm not sure I'm the expert on that subject. And yet I'm asked to speak on it. Um, I go right back to being a second grade panic to death. So you never really kill those old voices or ghosts in your head, I don't think. But what's great about it and why I'm thankful for it is by the time I got in seventh grade, I already had my first job because I needed, well, thanks to my mother, she pushed me. I had a lifeguard kiddie pool job, right? But she pushed me into another form where I could perform. And what I was good at is not reading, but I was good with my mouth. 
So I could talk to people that, 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 that make everybody happy. And I started making my living right through high school and into college all the time. I had one, two, usually two jobs in college, but I was good at all of them because people liked me and I was on my feet and I was fast and I was fishing. So I discovered my better self. But thank God I had that background because without it, I don't think I would have been become a big success. I wouldn't have had the hunger to prove to the world that I am not stupid. And I really uh, still have those moments uh, on Shark Tank where I'm sick to my stomach, feeling like I'm not performing well, not saying the right thing. I'm, I have, I've been too quiet. I can't be heard. My voice isn't powerful enough. And all that panic starts. And it takes quite a bit to, to, to knock some brains back into my head and remind myself I'm past that. And probably what I have to say is going to be good enough, you know, uh, but it pushes me to perform all the time, like a neediness. I, I, of course, if I employed a good shrink, I could straighten all this mess out, but I don't because I'm too cheap to spend money on it. And I don't want to tell people my shrink and I were talking, you know, but uh, that was the best background looking back, but the worst background as it happened. You I got paid this. well for it is what I'm saying. I got paid well. It was worth it. <laughs> You famously sold your company for $66 million. At what point did you realize that you were going to sell your company? When did you feel it was right? Because I would imagine that your company was your baby. It was something you'd built from the ground up. You'd nurtured it. You had built it. And then there comes a point where you say, okay, I can cash out. What was the decision making back then where you realized this was what I need to do? Uh, you know, it wasn't that calculated, honestly. I had had my first baby when I was 46. I couldn't have a baby and I had seven years of in vitro. When Tommy was finally born, I had him as one, two, three-year-old, four-year-old, I guess. I was so drawn and quartered in my business. I had my star salespeople demanding my attention at 6.30 in the morning. And I had my son when he was first born wanting me to nurse him. I mean, it was weird. It was like, who is this person? I had sibling rivalry play out in my heart every day of the week between my business and my own children. My Then I subsequently had a, a, a daughter 10 years after that, but it was tough. I wanted to be the super mom at work. I knew I was, I adored everybody who worked for me. Well, with a few exceptions, quite honestly. And with a few exceptions, they all adored me, okay? And I wanted that to continue. And I, I was already the number one real estate uh, company in the residential space. And that's the night when I realized that clears a button that I'll sell this thing. And I sold it right away. It was not any more thought than that. It was the, uh, it was the second year, no, it was the first year I had made money. Think about that. I worked my whole life. I always made less money than the least paid person in the company because I plowed it back into the business as we all do. But one year, accidentally, I had over a million dollars left. I'm like, a million dollars? How did we not spend that on something, you know? And in realizing that, I said, this thing must be worth something. You know, we had a thousand people. We had the number one spot because my partner and I, the night before, were doing our usual monthly body count, which went like this. There was no MLS. So you had no idea who had control of the market. But we went through every company's listing by price category, by size category, massive charts by hand. One night, one actually it was one night a quarter, not one night a month, one night a quarter. And we put all the numbers. And that one night we looked and I said to Esther, oh, look, we're number one straight from the top to the bottom on all sizes, east side, west side, you know, downtown was not, was just developed for about five years at that point, downtown or for what it was. And I said, let's sell this place. And she goes, okay. <laughs> and we sold it. And it was, it was a fast sale. I mean, we had an offer initially, I was on a, a, a ski chair with my brother, John, the roofer for my whole hometown. And I said, John, look, look, I just got a $22 million offer for the company. He goes, my brother, John talks like he's like, I talked when I was in New York. Good job, Bob. You think they'll really give you the cash? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. And I said, I think they will, but I'm going to ask them for 66. And that's what they ultimately paid. Why are you going to ask them for 66? Because it's my lucky number. Good idea, Barb. Luck is luck. <laughs> and that's how we sold the business. It, 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 didn't, it didn't take any advanced thinking or analytics or anything smart. <laughs> and I sh should have probably uh, hired somebody from Harvard right away to do an analysis. <laughs> But it wasn't about that. It was time. I didn't want that. Uh, 
I didn't want the competition in my heart every day of my life. It just seemed like the right time. Yeah. So when that happens and you realize you're quote unquote rich at that point, and rich means different things to different people, but that's a pretty extensive amount of money. What was For your me, mindset? It was. Yeah, it was, I mean, it's a, it's a huge amount of money, but were you kind of like, what's next? Or was it the opposite? Was it like, I'm ready for a breather and I want to enjoy my family and my life at the moment? Well, I wanted to uh, have more latitude with my son and be more present with him. It wasn't like I didn't pick him up after school at 3.30 every day and walk him to school. I did. But what was on my mind from 3.30 till 7.30 was all the stuff I didn't get done, you know, not the healthiest way to live, like not being in your shoes, so to speak. So I wanted, that was my, uh, the, the dragon I wanted to slay. And I did right away. I had nothing else to work on. Like, what was I going to think about? So he had too many clothes, too many colors. <laughs> I focused on dressing him well, a very important thing, <laughs> making a few dinners. And within three months, I realized I had to, I had to do something. I kind of pictured myself better at leisure uh, than I could ever be. Uh, my leisure to a large degree is creativity. And when you have a business, what's beautiful about it, if you're a marketing type person, is you have a giant blackboard, you can put up there whatever you want. You think of it on a Monday, get out on the streets on Wednesday. At home, what was I going to do? Learn to make another casserole? Somehow it felt a little quiet and mundane. And so I knew in short order, I had to change uh, my life and become somebody else. But what to become wasn't so easy. And for the first three years, trying to choose uh, to be a real estate personality in the media space uh, was easy enough from the outside, I guess it would look, but it was not easy actually doing it uh, because everyone wanted to meet me in the TV world, but uh, they wanted to meet me to ask me what I thought their house was worth. <laughs> it always was the last question. Oh, by the way, one last question, you know, what do you think my house is worth in Greenwich right now? I'm on six acres and blah, blah. That's usually was a typical interview. So getting that start was not so easy, but once I get my teeth in something, I can usually uh, chug it uh, faster and harder than the next guy. And so I was able to make good traction pretty fast. And I got a part-time, but still a real official paid gig on the Today Show as a real estate expert as the market crash, which was fortuitous for me, not for everybody else, uh, but what works better than bad news, nothing. So I was on every week talking about the bad news and how bad has been, how bad has been, bad, 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 bad. And uh, that gave me a voice in the media space, although my expertise, of course, was the one thing I knew, which was real estate. So one of the main reasons that I started this show, Barbara, was to talk to successful people about uh -huh. the unique aspects of what made them successful and dig uh -huh. into the cool parts of their careers. We conclude the show with a segment from our presenting sponsor, Penex, a Villanova insurance partners company. And with real estate, what I'm always fascinated by is home uh -huh. staging. I love home uh -huh. staging. Yes. How important is home staging in the sales process? It is the sales process. Think about it. You know, it used to be an extra uh, sellers didn't want to spend the money on it. It's hard to ask someone who has exited mind. They want to get money out to put money in. That's the problem with selling home staging. Uh, but all you have to do is show someone uh, how houses look online which is now the curb appeal, the front yard of every home in America. People don't start by riding neighborhoods, they start online, everybody does, right? And how homes present online. All you have to do is show a homeowner uh, what it looks like staged, not staged, uh, prime, fixed up, not fixed up. And they it's almost like someone would have to be a moron uh, not to listen. So staging can make good staging can make a difference of not only 10% in the value of the half a home, I think sometimes 15%, particularly the larger the home and the more expensive the location, people will uh, not forgive you as much if you haven't staged. But staging uh, can make all the difference between selling or not in a soft market. You know, we have a market right now, everything's selling. So people tend to think, well, I don't have to really doll it up. But, oh, yes, you do. It makes such a difference with the staging. And these professional people are paid well for a reason. Uh, they are your partner in the sales process. They're a salesman. They're not a stager. They're a salesman. And, uh, and I generally find that people, surprisingly, uh, judge a living room by the size of the area rug, ridiculous as that might sound, not the size of the walls. Uh, they judge the upkeep of the house, how the plumbing is based on how neat the closet is. <laughs> 
I know it's weird as it is. I know I've shown homes my whole life, right? Uh, they think, oh, if it's neat in the closet behind that door, oh, this house must be in great shape. Not necessarily true. Maybe the foundation's falling apart. But staging uh, gives such a great first impression uh, and a lasting one and gets you competitive bids at a higher price than you would have gotten without the staging. My final question for you, Barbara, you've had so many great investments. and I know It better be, will you marry me? Because you know why, Arthur? I am looking for a younger man. And a guy like you is kind of what I have in mind. So ask me that last question, but it better be the right one. Listen, your husband's like a former Navy SEAL and FBI agent. I'm going, yes, nowhere, right. I'm going nowhere near you because I might disappear and that could be the end of it. So I like my life. Pack a gun. He doesn't pack a gun and he's old now. So don't worry about old Bill. <laughs> Put him my in the final, sky. <laughs> for you, Barbara, obviously you've had so many successful investments, probably some failures. And people have always asked you about your investments. But for you, what has been the most gratifying moment in the journey? Doesn't have to be an investment, but truly gratifying moment. Oh, easy. The first thing always comes to my mind would be the last thing if you gave me an hour to think about it. One year at the Corcoran Group, I had 48,000, I think, in profit. Again, an accident. Because I spent every penny a mile before it was coming in on a new office, new computer system, new recruit. I couldn't keep money in my hand. Okay. But on that one year, I find myself with this money. So my mother and father never had a nice car. You know, we, were, we had 10 kids. My dad had his blue beauty, which was a Chevrolet, which was new at one point when I was a little kid. But we had it through the next eight kids after me. And it was beat up. Everybody learned to drive on it, crashed into shit. You know, it was a terrible car. I bought him a brand new Lincoln Continental. He was retired in Florida. And I bought my mother a brand new Pontiac convertible. She had never had a car and I only got her license for five years. And I had my uncle Richie and his friend drive it down to Florida, put a bow and leave it in their driveway. That was without a doubt, nothing. I could be struck as maybe marry Mark Cuban instead and be a billion billionaire but I would never feel as rich and as thankful as that moment. And to hear them call up I, to them. I mean, I would even like the car. They were nice cars, no doubt, but I wouldn't cry over a car. They just couldn't believe it. And that for me was the best thing that ever happened in my life in terms of sheer satisfaction and joy. That was awesome. You're amazing, Barbara. Congratulations on everything. You're an example to all entrepreneurs everywhere on the hustle and the grit that it takes to make it. Thank you for a wonderful chat. My pleasure. Don't forget to promote my podcast now, Business Unusual. Wherever you find your podcast, don't let me down, author. No, actually, before you go, how much fun are you having with the podcast? Let's plug it quickly. Hey, it's about time you picked up the hint a little late on the drawer there. Um, what's great about the podcast is there's only one thing that I do well. I swear to God, maybe a couple of things, but the thing I think I do best is give good advice because I tell it like it is. I don't think there's a single person who calls my 888 Barber number who thinks to themselves, oh, maybe I shouldn't have called it. Everybody's so thankful. I feel like I help people every day of the week on that number and on my podcast. And I choose those questions that I think pertain to the most folks out there, stuff they could use. So I, I think it's a, I guess a self-help line, if you want, having to do with business and actualizing who you want to be. And uh, for those reasons, I think you're crazy if you don't Listen to my podcast and nuts if you don't call 888. And I'm going to check in a half hour, Arthur. And if your proposal is on that 88 line, I'm coming after you. Barbara, will you marry me? 888. Barbara, will you marry me? Yes, I will. Just let me clean up the little thing with Bill back at the farm. <laughs> By the way, are you on that Wheaties box behind you? Is that you? That was given to me. Yeah, that is me. Let me show it to you. Where is it? Yeah. Right I love this. I've been search. I've been looking at that. I'm like, is that Barbara? Oh my God, that's amazing. You know, the best part about this box, it was given to me as a gift from Sharon Baum, my first heavyweight salesman I recruited out of another firm. And she was so happy to be with me. She made this as a gift. I will never give it away because it's a symbol of uh, the power of hiring the right person. Truly. I love it. If you marry me, it's part of the deal. I love it. And you get okay. to keep it in the future divorce. Get out of here, Arthur. I have something to do. Bye. Barbara, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for a okay. wonderful chat. Take Ciao. care. Bye-bye. <laughs>